Uh, what got you there with got you got you? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there uh, with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Philip Stutz is the author of Fire Them Now: The Seven Lies Digital Marketers Sell and the Truth About Political Strategies That Help Businesses Win, an Amazon bestseller. And he's one of the masterminds behind the curtain of political marketing. With more than 20 years of political and marketing experience, Stutz has worked with multiple Fortune 200 companies, has over two decades of experience working on campaigns with billions of dollars in ad spend politically, and contributed to over 1,200 election victories, including hundreds of U.S. House campaigns, dozens of U.S. Senate campaigns, and even three U.S. presidential victories. Hey guys, are you interested in receiving 20% off your entire order of the apparel brand that's taking the fitness world by storm? If so, head to 10,000.cc, use discount code WGYT, and you're going to be getting 20% off your entire order of my favorite fitness apparel brand, 10,000. 10,000 is making the most comfortable and versatile shorts out there on the planet. I recently picked up a pair of their interval shorts, which are perfect for a long hike, or an intense session in the gym. I'm loving their stuff and highly recommend you guys check them out. Remember, head to 10,000.cc, use discount code WGYT, and you guys will be feeling good and looking good. Philip, welcome to What Got You There. How are you doing today? Oh, man, I'm great. Appreciate you having me on. I'm really honored. Yeah, no, excited about this one. I know the listeners are going to gain a ton of value hearing from you. I'm curious, though, how do you start your day? How do I start my day? Every, every... I get this question a lot and I used to have like this standard answer. And the, the truth of the matter is uh, everybody says, you know, you have to have this like one routine and everything. And if I could, I would. Uh, but every day for me is completely different. Um, if I if I had my druthers, my routine would be to wake up at 430 in the morning, work out, meditate, eat breakfast, hang out with my kid and my wife and then get into the office about 730. If I do that, I, I'm on fire, but I have a child, a six-year-old, and sometimes life gets in the way. I'm also on the road about 50% of the time, and that's harder because I have to stay out later to meet with clients or meet with friends. So every day is different. I have an ideal day, and that's what I strive for, but you know, I also value sleep. And if I haven't slept, then I won't get up at 4.30. I'll get up at 5.30. I love how you answered that question. I think so many people feel the need to answer it the way of your your typical day and ideal day. So a lot of entrepreneurs, I'm sure, are glad you answered it that way. When you're not having the necessary amount of sleep that you need, is there anything that you still make sure you do? Any non-negotiables you have? <sighs> it's a good question. No, you know, I have this, uh, I have an aura ring. I don't know if you're familiar with the aura ring. Uh, Peter Diamandis uh, introduced it to me. Basically, I wear it like a wedding band, <clears throat> and it is, it's like a Fitbit for sleep. And I you know, wear it all day long, and then I sleep in it. It literally can track when I fall asleep. It literally can track when I wake up and roll over. It can tell me how much REM sleep I've had, how much deep sleep I've had, and, and it gives me a score. And I've learned so much about my sleep patterns that all I know is I look at my score in the morning and go, okay, that's how I've got to focus my day. You know, maybe it's, uh, I have two meditations instead of one. It kind of just depends on the sleep I get the night before. I got you. Yeah, I haven't used an aura ring before. I'm familiar with it. I'm using a device called Whoop right now. I just got introduced to. So do you have any routines in the evening? You put a high priority on sleep. Anything you do to unwind? Yeah, I turn all my devices off. Um, <laughs> I'm a digital marketer, <laughs> but I, uh, so the reason I like to get in the office early in the morning is I like to study every day. Uh, I always talk about how I like to work on my business, not just in my business. And I think for your business owners out there, if you want to 10x your business, that is the, the difference that makes the difference is the ability to work on the business. And so I commit every single day to work on my business, not just in my business. And then, so I try to leave the office between 4.30 and 5.30 every day, which is insanely early, but I get in early. And, um, and then, you know, pr frankly, I have a six-year-old. I have one kid. I'm only going to have one kid. I get one chance 
at her at this time in her life. And I want to spend time with her. And so we come home and I'll turn off my device for a few hours and I'll spend time with my wife and my little girl and we'll cook dinner. Or we'll go ride bikes or play basketball or do whatever. And then uh, I put her to bed, walk the dogs, get in bed, check everything, go to bed. That's pretty It's my boring life. <laughs> you, you mentioned working on your business. I'm curious how you allocate your time. You mentioned that, that you're studying the business. Do you block those times off during the day, during the week, during the months to make sure you can really focus on that? Yeah, here's the big hack that I learned. And there's a book uh, that really helped me, Ned Hallowell. Um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's called Driven to Distraction. But what, what the book basically does is it, it asks the question, when is your brain on fire and when do you need to you know, get boosted up on things? And so what I realized in my own brain was that early in the morning, I am analytical. Um, I can study. I can concentrate for longer periods of time. And I really am creative. I mean, uber, uber creative, whether that's working on client issues or just in my business. And so I allocate every single morning to study uh, an hour or two, sometimes three hours to study. Nothing else. Read, uh, work on, you know, the culture of my business, work on the financial side of my business, but like something that's learning, not, not, uh, not sort of doing or, you know, doing my books or anything. It's like, how can I learn a better financial system? How can I save more money? How can I, um, you know, be more innovative? And that's every single day I have to, it, it literally gives me the fire and energy to get through the rest of the day. Um, and so that's the time that I allocate it. And then I allocate other pockets of time to work on clients, um, to, to meet with my team, to manage my team. You know, like I get just like most people, I get really tired in the afternoons and I don't, drink caffeine in the afternoon. And so I'll typically meditate for 20 minutes and that gives me a boost of energy. But I also do a lot of conference calls in the afternoon because that also boosts my energy to have that interaction with other people. And so that's how I efficiently driven my day, if that makes sense. No, it makes perfect sense. This is hitting on exactly what I'm really interested in right now. I'm very similar and I'm most creative in the morning. You talk about the consumption of new knowledge. You mentioned reading. Is there any other thing you do? Do you follow particular blogs? Are you consuming podcasts? Are there any other mediums you use to learn new things? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm a... I listen to tons of podcasts, tons, uh, and they always vary and they change and they, you know, you know, I'll, I'll listen to some for a while and I'll move on to others. I'm just trying to find, you know, value, even if, you know, I have this theory, Sean, that in my business, um, that if I can identify one to two to three things each week to improve in the business and you multiply that over 52 weeks, you're talking about between 100 and 150 improvements in your business. You do that over 10 years, you're talking about a thousand to 2000 improvements in your business. There's a, you know, this isn't a, a, one of these brags, but there's a reason that that works for me. We started, I started my marketing agencies uh, less than four years ago. I, I have no debt in my company. Uh, I low, well, I mean, no, I gave myself a hundred thousand dollars to start the business. We surpassed $22 million this year and I have no debt and I have no outside investment. And that is because I work on my business and I'm committed every single week to improving a process, an idea, um, a management style. I mean, I'm, I'm committed to doing one to three improvements a week on my business. So let's talk specifically what it is that you actually do. How do you articulate that? And then I want to know about the idea to not take on any debt. I have to assume you could have scaled faster bringing on debt. So I'm, I'm interested in that decision as well. Well, I've never marked, I mean, I'm a marketing, I have two marketing agencies, a corporate marketing agency and a political marketing agency. And, and we've never run an ad ever on our business, ever. I, uh, I built it and, and I, you know, talk about this a little bit in the book, but I built my entire business on three R's, referral, relationship, and reputation. And so, first of all, you know, I've, uh, I've done a ton of TV over the years. I've done over 200 TV hits and a ton of podcasts and stuff like that. So I have a reputation. And then I, I've been able to build relationships off that. And then from that, I built uh, referral systems in my business. 
And those three things have driven a huge success. I mean, again, we've doubled the company every single year or more than doubled it every single year. And really, if you look at a hundred thousand investment of my own money uh, to 22 million, that's a 22,000% increase in less than four years. And so uh, I've never marketed. I've never run a marketing dollar on my own business. Uh, I've really based every, my marketing is the three R's. That's my marketing right there. I'd love unpacking these three R's. You talk about reputation, how you've built that reputation. When you first set out, did you identify these three R's and, and did you understand what it was going to take to really build that reputation? Well, I, I didn't, I didn't realize that I was doing it in my own business. What I understood was that's exactly how we run marketing campaigns for politicians. That is exactly what we do. Think about this. The politician has a reputation in the community and decides to run for office. And then he has to build relationships. And so that politician, in the, w in the way we market them, we yes, we run ads, but we have to run very creative ads that connect with people emotionally and build the relationship, even if they don't know them. A lot of times our, our politicians are, you know, walking in parades, doing town halls, um, you know, meeting voters, doing press conferences, walking door to door and knocking on the doors of voters and meeting them and building relationships that way. And then once you have great creative marketing in like TV ads or uh, digital ads or whatever, and you've built personal relationships, then you leverage that into referrals. So in politics, we're just always getting like, hey, you know, tell your, you know, it's sort of the if you, you, know, you commit a voter to vote for a candidate, then we're trying to expand that person's, you know, you know, sort of. Uh, the whole strategy of, of what we're trying to do is get that voter to get 10 more people to vote for, you know, for that particular candidate. And so if that's what we're ultimately trying to do is win over voters with reputation and relationship and then use that as leverage to build a referral. And then, I, ooh, that's how we should build our own business. And really, while I do have a, a reputation in, in, in having done a lot of media, I built the reputation by success. Uh, we built businesses and, you know, we've, we've won thousands of races in politics. Um, and I've worked on three presidential campaigns or three winning presidential campaigns. And so I, people won't hire me if I'm not successful. People want to know that someone has been successful and then thus they're going to help them be successful. And so what I focused on more than anything, Sean, was how can I be successful for my clients first? And ultimately, I'll win. And that's how I built the whole, my whole business. So for, you know, for any business owner out there, it's like, how do you serve the people that you're supposed to serve? How are you giving them the best service, the best products, whatever it is? How do you make what you do the best and build that reputation and then leverage that into the better relationships and better referral systems? Oh, Philip, I absolutely love that. I'm curious, though, how did you initially get into marketing? I mean, I, I, I grew up campaigns. So, you know, I've been working on political campaigns for over 20 years. Um, and I, you know, I always say I was a, a homeless vagabond. Um, it, it's hard to describe if you've never worked in politics, but, you know, I, 1996, I moved out to San Diego in 99. I lived in Phoenix for a year working on political campaigns. I lived in South Dakota for a year, I lived in Louisiana for a year, I lived in New Mexico, all running and working on political campaigns. And, you know, I paid my dues. Like I know there's this, uh, there's this hope, uh, for most entrepreneurs that they can take a get rich quick pill and all of a sudden it works. Like, Hey, just give me the pill and my business 10 X. It really, it really doesn't work like that. And I had to pay my dues. Like the, I'm, I'm 44 now. Uh, no one had ever heard of me or seen me or I'd never even gone on TV until I was 38. I just put my head down and worked and learned and grew and figured out what, what worked and what didn't. And I paid my dues. And at a certain point, I said, I want to take this to another level. And that's sort of where it came from. And so I lived all over the country working on political campaigns, running the marketing for political campaigns. Um, I did it, whether it would be on presidential campaigns, U.S. Senate campaigns, governor races, congressional races, even state Senate, state house races, um, every type. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting. There's so many parallels between what we do in politics and, and how we have success for our business clients. So we have a lot of business clients that are small businesses. Kind of reminds me of like a state Senate race. 
We have Fortune 200 clients. Kind of reminds me of presidential campaigns. We have, if you think about it, in politics, it's the ultimate startup company. You have a politician that starts with zero dollars, zero name, ID, or brand. And we are brought on and we have to raise millions of dollars. And the only difference is we have to spend it all in nine months or 10 months. And so it's this whole, we're broke, we ramp up. Oh my God, we got money. Let's spend it all. And if we don't, then we're failures. And the other thing that's so crazy about this, Sean, is that in politics, uh, every client I've ever had is listed in a public, publicly available database. And all the money that they give us is in that database. So all of my competitors know who I'm working for. And if I lose more than a win, do you, what do you think my competitors will do to me? You're going to be crushed. I'm going to be crushed. So how motivated am I to innovate? I am on like, all I think about is I've got to make, make sure the client wins. I got, I got to innovate for them. I got to constantly make them better. And that mindset is why our corporate marketing agency has had so much success because everybody in my company thinks this way. Because we're thinking, here's the thing. Every, you know, I wrote the book because of the frustration I kept seeing from business owners in, in, with marketing agencies. And what I realized was so many marketing agencies go for the quick dollar. They go for, Hey, you got to pay us a bunch of money. I can't guarantee anything. Uh, oh, here's a shiny new object. You've got to do that. And ultimately more times than not, the business failed, but the marketers made money. And I went, ooh, that'll never work in politics. In political marketing, I only succeed if my candidate succeeds. If my candidate succeeds, then I can use that, like I said, for relationship referral um, and, you know, and uh, reputation. But if my candidate loses, I can't do any of that. And so I went, hold on, I'm going to write a book about how the business should win before the marketing agency. And here's the deal and the way I look at it. Um, any, you know, all the companies that work with us, we make a lot of money on them because we've made them succeed first. They only six, we only succeed if they succeed first. That's the entire mission of our marketing agency. And because of that, we've been able to scale really fast. You mentioned the ability to scale. I'm curious when a new client comes to you guys, what are you first looking at? What are you assessing? How are you? figuring out if this is going to be a good relationship and if you can add value? So it's such a good question. And um, I'm not a good fit for all businesses. So I have um, a way that we do it. And it's the only way you can work with me. And the first thing you have to do is, uh, the whole thing is I have to build trust and eliminate risk for the business. And so uh, the first thing any business has to do is they have to, to run a research and uh, research report on their customer base or their client base. And the reason I do this is I'm not serving the business. I'm serving the customer or client. And I need to know how they think and how they feel. And I think marketing agency that doesn't undertake a research project first on the customer base is literally taking advantage and screwing over a business. And so every business that comes in has to under, it's kind of like in, in, in uh, politics, we take a poll when we get hired by a candidate. Um, we find out what the voters think. We tailor our message and our brand around the things that the, the voter cares about. And so then I went, why don't businesses do this more? And so what we do is we partnered with the largest data collection company in, in America. We're the only marketing firm that has a partnership with them. And we can take a, a company's database or a lookalike audience and we can ascertain thousands upon thousands of data points and understand how they think and feel, what motivates them, what values them, what platforms they're on. And then we can eliminate almost 50% of the risk right there because why would I run a marketing campaign unless I knew what the customer wanted and what the customer felt? We did this recently for a, a client and they had built their business pretty well, but they run an entire marketing campaign for the last few years on discounts because they thought their customers wanted discounts. They just thought it. They, it was sort of an ignorant you know, way of running a marketing campaign. And it had worked for a while until it didn't. And then they found they realized they lost $1.6 million 
uh, in marketing dollars and no growth in the business because they were running on discounts. So they came to us. We ran a research report for them. It's called an audience insights report. And we found out that their customer base had changed that while maybe five, six years ago, discounts mattered because the economy hadn't roared back. Now they wanted a higher standard. They wanted green products. They wanted more, they, they would pay more money for a higher standard. And we found out that their customer base bundled services. So their cable services or other things that they did, they bundled services. And that's how they looked at discounts, that they were, it was a smarter choice. We also found out that, that their customer base was very family oriented and cared about what was going on in the community. This was a family business. They had never touted that they were a family business. And so we re we re changed everything because here's the deal. Sorry, I'm going to rant, but here's the deal. Uh, it's about a strategy and you put your tactics under a strategy. I hate when I get a business in place and they go, they just want to run a bunch of tactics. There's no strategy in place. What we knew was the strategy had to be, we had to tell a family story. We had to create uh, a marketing plan and a marketing campaign that said this company has high standards and safe products and not discounts because discounts are cheap to the customer and they don't want to buy cheap. And when we did that, we completely reversed the loss of the company and grew that business. They were, they were a $20 million business. Now they're, they're over 20 million in business. And that's how, that's how I went, Jesus, no one does this. Why are people doing this? So we, that is our, that's what we do. And businesses can come at us and they say, no, 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 I don't want that research. I just want some Facebook ads. And I'll say, you're not a good fit for us because I'm not in it to get their cheap money and walk away after a month. I'm in it to grow with them, but they have to earn, but they have to, they have to see the growth themselves. The other part of this that I, that I will not um, negotiate on is I've never had a long-term contract in my entire career. So whether it be in politics or in or our business clients, every contract I have is month to month. Every marketing agency I have ever studied does long-term contracts, six month contracts, 12 month contracts, things like that. If I'm not proving it every month to that business owner, I should be fired. So how quickly am I to innovate? How quickly am I to move? How quickly am I to think about their business growth rather than my short term on the cash and checks? Everything, it's all mindset. My mindset is I got to grow this business and I got to constantly help them or they can get rid of me. And again, that's one of the reasons why we scaled so fast. The listeners are really getting a clear picture of, of who you are, how you operate. I feel like you do a great job of finding the white space and opportunities. Earlier, you mentioned paying your dues when you were first getting started. I want to do a little self-assessment here. What do you think you executed on really well? Obviously, you had to have differentiated yourself when you're working on these political campaigns. What were you really good at at the time? I, I think I um, I have nervous energy. I'm probably ADHD to like a 10th degree, which I think a lot of entrepreneurs. So I feel like I can handle 30 things on my plate at once and I can execute on all of them and it doesn't overwhelm me. And I think that that's sort of, you know, what, what was interesting, Sean, um, my entire life, from the time I was a little kid until I was at, at you know, graduate college, I was told I was dumb. I was told I was not smart and uh, that I had to take Ritalin and, you know, ADD, ADHD medication because I really wasn't very smart. And that's how I was. That's what I model. Like that's, that was my mindset. Oh, I'm not smart. I have to prove it. Um, and what I've realized later in life is it was an asset. It was a gift. I, um, and it's really the ultimate gift. I, I think it is uh, a talent, not a weakness. And I just decided at some point, wow, this thing actually works for me and helps me be more successful. Um, I don't have, I don't take any of the medications at all. Uh, but I, you know, it, it, I would tell you that that's probably it. I can handle a lot of things on my plate and I'm not over my vibe. So how do you differentiate then between accepting a, a new opportunity and saying no to things? I know so many entrepreneurs, so many business owners, they talk about being able to say no and how that adds so much value to them. Do you say no to a lot of things or do you see yourself taking on more and more? <clears throat> it's such a good question. I um, Look, I've built a successful company um, and so I have the ability to say no. 
um, it's not going to affect my bottom line. So I want to do things the right way. I want to help people grow. I, it, it, this is not um, a money grab for me. It is a purpose driven grab. I don't, you know, sure. There have been points in my business where that was a very big stress point. Um, you know, three and a half years ago when we were building this from scratch, um, you get faced with that dilemma a lot. You know, do we take this or do we hold tight to what we know is true? Uh, I would say 95% of the time I've held tight. And then the 5% I learned big lessons from because it was a colossal failure to try to meet, um, you know, whether it be politicians or business owners at a point I knew was going to fail. Like I, I hoped it didn't, but hope is not a strategy. Um, and so I just said at a certain point, I'm not negotiating on this anymore. I'm in it to help these businesses. I know how to do it the right way. And I know how to do it in a way that eliminates a ton of risk off their plates. And if they don't see that, then we're not going to get, in, we're not going to be involved with them. Ultimately, all I really care about is alignment. The business owner and I have to be in alignment. If, and again, it's their business. It's their pride and joy. It is their investment. And I respect that. Sometimes I feel like I respect it more than the business owner because they just want to cut corners and I, I'm just not cutting. Corners. So I learned some lessons early on and then I just decided not to deviate from it after that. Philip, you mentioned colossal failures. How do you process failures in your brain? When, when you're looking back on some of your big failures, how do they attribute to where you're at now? Well, I mean, I, I mean, I have failures every single day. Like, you know, the, the, the big lie, I think, and, and a lot of the people that, you know, that, you know, come on shows or talk about their success is that they, they act like they've never had failure. I, I, I have massive failure every day. I, I cannot tell you this, like, but it, none of that bothers me. Like, it just doesn't bother me. I go, Oh, this is a learning experience. Like, I get it. This is, you know, like my entire model, um, was, you know, we're trying to figure this thing out for, for years, um, on the, <clears throat> on the corporate side. And, you know, I failed because I just figured business owners would see, uh, a parallel industry and go, Ooh, I want that. That's an innovative approach sort of marketing for politicians. Business owners didn't give a shit about that. And I had to go through a lot of pain and failure, not in the approach, but in, I mean, in the approach, not in the execution. And so, that and and that wasn't like one small failure. That was literally like nine straight months of failure of trying to help. Like, you know, sometimes you probably understand this, right? Like you want to like look at people and go, don't you get it? <laughs> the dumbest thing you can do. And like, of course, I did that for months. Like I would sit there and be like, no, 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 you don't understand. We've grown businesses. What are you doing? Like, you know, you want to yell, but that's not the way it works. Business owners have blood, sweat, and tears into their business. They're proud of their business. I respect the hell out of that. I'm doing it myself. And so once I said, it's not about me, it is about them. And I put my ego aside, you know, and then, you know, you know, and, and that was, that was a huge lesson for me. Um, and, and then that is when, you know, on our corporate side, we went from, you know, eight clients to 28 clients. So, it, it literally was like once the light went off, the switch went off in my head and I just said, stop making this about you. No one gives a shit about you. It's about them. It's about helping them. That is when all of a sudden businesses started hiring us because it was I got I got out of my own ego on it. And so that, that really is where one of my big failures that I, I think I look back on from a few years ago and saw a transition. No, I love how you answered that. And that's what I, I wanted to uncover with that question. A lot of people, they'll have a failure, they'll dwell on it. You take that as a learning experience and are able to move on. A, a reoccurring theme I keep hearing you talk about is how you serve others and putting your ego aside. It makes me think of relationships. And that's obviously one of your three R's. How do you really forge those relationships? How, how do you stay in touch? I'm assuming the number of years you've been in business, your Rolodex is unbelievably large. How do you still stay in contact and continue to build those relationships? Um, I, I think it is, it's not like I have some system in place. Um, I just have, right. I, I have a nice Rolodex of people 
Um, and I check in with them and I try to, again, this is like one of the things I block out time uh, to think about my relationships. And I know that sounds crazy, but um, I, you know, I didn't always do that. Um, I, I was a mess for a long time, Sean. And uh, again, I, that sort of ego that got in the way. Um, and when I realized, you know, I did a, a lot of work on myself, <laughs> a lot of self-help work. Um, and what I realized was that in order to have fulfillment and purpose in my, I had to stop thinking of myself more than others. And so really, if you, you know, everybody has uh, values in their company and sometimes they're generic garbage and they don't mean anything. And, um, I just have two values of the company. It's give and grow. That's it. Give and grow. You have to give more than you take and you have to always be growing. And if you want to work with us, um, that's sort of the mindset you got to have. And if the reason I set those values in place is because that was what I was striving to be, not that I was there. That's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a giver and wanted to grow. And when you put it on, you know, you put it on everything, you put it on your website, you put it on walls, you put it on everything and you look at it every day, you're forced to say, I got to give and grow. And so then you start thinking about, well, how do I do that? And then, you know, you take the relationships you've built and, you know, we designed an entire company around giving and growing. We designed, you know, um, we first we built it within. And so within our, our company, we have what's called the, the B, I don't even talk about this a lot, but uh, we call it the BPI program, a big personal impact. Um, we are, you know, go big media and win big media, the two marketing agencies. So it's big personal impact. And we try to figure out everybody that works in our company, what they care about. Uh, people that are important in their lives, um, anything that's personal. And then when that employee or that team member does something really good or they perform really well, we try to deliver on that. So, you know, I, I, an example is we have a, one of our team members who loves his grandparents and they they're in their nineties and they're really sick right now and they're in the hospital and he was distraught over them, um, it being, you know, in, you know, in, in a bad position or a bad place. And we knew how much that meant to him. And so we sent, you know, a $500 bouquet of flowers to the hospital. And we wrote a note or I wrote a note that said, you know, um, I'll just call him John. Uh, you know, your grandson, John, is you should be proud of him. He is an exceptional human being, uh, a good man and a great team member on our team. And he loves you more than life itself. And I want you to know how proud you should be of him. And when those grandparents got it, they cried and they called him and he cried and he came to us. And, you know, I could have given him a thousand dollar check for doing good work. Uh, instead, we tried to be creative in thinking about how we care about other people, and build that relationship. And so that's an example of what we do in our company. And then I, I said to myself and part of the thinking that I do on my business, I said, how can we do this for clients? So we've now designed the entire program for our clients where we try to understand everything that motivates them, drives them. Um, and we try to deliver in a very personal way to make them and to understand how much we actually care about them. And then with the book, I decided to create a, a way that we would do this for people that don't even work with us, that aren't clients. And, and, and so, and, and we've talked about this, uh, I'll offer this at the, uh, at the end of the podcast as an offer. But my point is, that's how I build relationships. I'm just trying to show greater value. And I want to, and it feels good. It feels good to help other people. And that feels a lot better than me trying to say, what about me all the time? Philip, this is exactly why I wanted to have you on. You mentioned all the self-help work you did on yourself and how that's led to new things and new focuses. Even bringing up that story about the BPI, it, it's, it's so unbelievable to hear the little things you're doing in your business, with your employees, with the relationships you have. These little tactics are, are what the listeners are going to get the most value in. And, and you mentioned you even schedule time to, to build these relationships and reach out to people. When you are reaching out to these people, maybe you haven't talked to in a few years, what's that approach look like? How are you reaching out to them? Well, one of the things that I do, and this is another good little tactic people can use, is I write thank you notes. I, I, I write notes to people, uh, handwritten notes. Um, I will write you, Sean, a handwritten note after this podcast, not because I'm trying to check off a list, because I'm grateful that you would have me on and I had a platform to, to give my message out. 
Um, and the chance that I get, you know, you reached out to me proactively. I, I'm honored by that. Um, and I want to build a relationship with that. And that's how I look at everything. Um, another way is, um, look, I went on uh, Gary Vaynerchuk's show, right? The Daily V. And um, when it was over, I wrote a check to his favorite charity. Um, and it wasn't, again, it, it's because I was grateful. And I feel like, hey, you you let me come on your show. Like, how grateful am I for that? So for Gary, I you know wrote a check to some uh, whatever his charity is. I, it was back in April. I can't remember now. I think it's pencils uh, for, yeah, for pencils kids or something promise. like that. Yeah, Pence's Promise. Um, And, you know, there was a a Gary and I have a mutual friend. I wrote that person after the Gary V show. All he did was, you know, uh, introduce us. But after that show, I wrote him a check to his favorite charity. And again, I'm not not a bragging thing. It's like this is this is what people should do. Like we should do this. This is what the world should be like. Everybody, you know, here's the deal. Everybody in the world right now has their phone in front of their face. And every marketer out there is telling you, look, everybody's you know face is right in front of their phone. So uh, you, you got to you got to market to those people. And I'm telling you to do the complete opposite. I'm telling you to be an outlier. And the outlier is don't go where everybody's going. Yes, you can use digital marketing. I do a ton of digital marketing of millions of dollars a year for our clients. It is to reinforce a relationship, not build a relationship. To build a relationship, you've got to be you've got to do personal things to pe- for people. And you've got to make them feel really good. And you got to make them feel like, gosh, that guy doesn't necessarily want anything from me. He just wants to learn from me and grow with me. And that's just how I think we should look at things this, these days. And so that's sort of the approach I take. It's the approach you take. I, I'm wondering, the people that you've surrounded yourself with, who have left the biggest impacts on you? My wife, number one. Um, I'm, uh, uh, I, I don't, I don't know if many people could survive, uh, the, the transition I had to go through over the last few years. And this isn't about like anything I've done. I, um, I, I just, I was in a place that was, uh, heading, uh, I had poor health. Um, uh, my business at that point was not going anywhere. Um, my, my marriage was deteriorating. My child was born. And I wasn't spending time with her. And, um, uh, you know, I went to a Tony Robbins seminar and it woke my ass up. And that that was an introduction into change. But my wife is the one that was not patient with me and didn't give me an inch to make any excuses. Either I had to change the dynamic of my life and the wiring of my entire existence at, you know, 39, 40 years old, or, uh, I was going to have a broken family, a broken business, um, and, and broken health. And, um, and so I, I don't know if there's anybody that has had a bigger impact on me than my wife. And that's number one. Um, you know, my kid has been a monster, uh, person in my life to focus me, uh, because I realize what's important and what's not important. Uh, me gaining followers on social media isn't as important as turning off my phone and shooting hoops with my girl, you know? And so, you know, and being present, I think that's one of the things we, we face, whether it's millennials, uh, and everybody that works for me is millennial. I love millennials. Um, my entire workforce is millennials. So I'm a big proponent of that generation, but I think one of the ways that we try to train with them is to be more present, not only with clients, but with friends and family. Um, because when you have personal interaction, you build better relationships. And so, you know, I look at those two as more than anything, um, the, the most helpful for me. Yeah, you mentioned being present, and that's one of my big themes in 2019, how I can be more present with those around me. I'm curious and interested to hear you talk about big thinking and moonshot thinking. Uh, I know you've met with Peter Diamandis before, and and he inspires that moonshot thinking. First of all, what is moonshot thinking, and how has that impacted your life? Yeah, so I have a and this is a little monkey wrench in the interview, but I have an incurable esophageal disease, and for the first five years that I and basically my esophagus doesn't work. Um, the muscles and the nerves are dead. It'll never work the rest of my life. Um, to eat food is a really big chore. So 
you would think that I had spent years uh, researching this disease that I had. And the fact is the first five years, I didn't even Google it. I took the medications that my doctors gave me at the Mayo Clinic um, and I did nothing about it. And then when I was in the Mayo Clinic offices about two and a half years ago, they told me that I was facing a feeding tube for the rest of my life very soon. And I went, Ooh, I don't, I don't like that. I don't, I don't want to accept that. And they said, well, your disease is what it is. So, you know, take your medicines. By the way, the medicine has uh, long-term dementia effects, uh, but it works in the short run. Uh, I've had 15 minor procedures on my esophagus and three major surgeries. And basically, it's like, wait for the inevitable. And I just said, no, I'm going to do that. Now, that's total ignorance to say, no, I don't accept that for an, a rare and curable disease. There's not a lot of research dollars in rare and curable diseases. A few months later, I went to Peter Diamandis' uh, Abundance 360 conference. And he gets on the stage and he says, hey, before we get started, everybody, I want to talk about moonshots. I want everybody to pull out your notebooks and your pens. And I want you to write down a moonshot, something that people said is impossible that you will make possible in the next five years. And the, not only do I want you to write down the moonshot, I want you to write down three things you're going to do immediately once you leave this conference to give you some momentum. And so I wrote down in this business conference, I wrote down, I'll find a cure to my disease in five years. That was two years ago. And that was the moonshot. And so I immediately wrote an article, it got printed by Inc. Um, and it was called, you know, my personal moonshot. And I laid out my, what I thought I would, you know, what I said I was going to do. And uh, over, so, it, you know, it, so people read it that had researched this disease. Uh, they got me in touch with doctors. All of a sudden, a couple months later, I had a, a team of doctors at Johns Hopkins around me. Then we started talking about what a cure would look like. And then it's led to this crazy, um, <laughs> this crazy story that now I am about to start a one man first time ever clinical trial. Never been done on animals, never been done on anybody. They're going to extract stem cells out of my calf muscle. They will grow them for about four or five months. And then they will insert them into my esophagus to try to heal the esophagus and regenerate the muscles and the nerves. And I have no idea if it'll work. And I have no idea if it'll fail. Um, it's literally just complete um, first time. I don't know. We'll see. We're about to find out. I'm heading to Baltimore in, in a couple of weeks and it'll start the process. And this is all because a doctor told me um, that it was impossible and my ignorance and my determination, um, decided to take it as a moonshot and, and to really go after this thing. And so it sort of led to where I am right now. And that's, I guess that's the genesis of the moonshot. If that makes sense. No, perfect sense. Best of luck with that operation. And I'm, I'm hoping that inspires some moonshot thinking here for the listeners. I've got a couple quick hit questions for you. I know you got to get running soon. Who that you've been around in the past year? has impressed you most? You know, it's a really interesting question because um, I, I could easily answer that two years ago, three years ago, four years ago. The last year has been nothing but uh, book promotions. Oh, then, then, then go two, three years. I'd even love to hear that. Sure. So I'd say four years ago, it'd be Tony Robbins. Three years ago, it'd be a guy named Keith Cunningham, who is a business coach out of Austin, Texas, that is one of the smartest damn people I've ever worked with in my entire life. Two years ago, it was Jay Abraham and, and Peter Diamandis. Uh, I went to China with Diamandis and, and Jay Abraham and I worked on a bunch of projects together. Um, and, and, you know, I think it really more than anything, it's just a collection of the people that I've gotten to know through a lot of the book promotion. So, um, obviously Gary uh, Vaynerchuk was, was amazing and kind and generous. James Altucher um, was uh, truly one of the most generous people and smartest people and gave me good advice on some things that I had not thought about. Uh, a guy named Tucker Max, who uh, best-selling author, has been a mentor to me and, a, and just a really good buddy and helped me on a bunch of things, both business and on personal. Um, and those, you know, that that's, uh, uh, you know, those are three. Uh, Dr. Drew, Dr. Drew Pinsky. 
uh, has uh, helped me on a couple fronts and been really kind. Um, and so I, I don't know, I've got this weird tribe of mentors, I guess. Um, and then just random people you would never know. There's a guy named Paul Belair who's a, uh, sold a huge construction company and he's helped me understand what scaling a business really fast looks like and what to avoid and how to put different business systems in place. Um, those are just some of the people that have really helped me along the way. No, it's just so interesting hearing how you answer that question, who comes to mind for you. So I appreciate the answer there. Final thing, what should we be looking out for in 2019? I know you're specifically in the marketing industry. Anything we should keep our eyes out for? Um, I think, you know, if you're a business owner out there, <clears throat> more than anything else, it's not, look, the technologies are always going to change, Right. But it, more than anything, try to be different and figure out the outlier strategy. Ask yourself this question if you're a business owner right now. How many marketing strategies, can, strategic campaigns do I want to run in my business in the next five to 10 years? How many? If I'll give you an example. Um, if you were to look at Chick-fil-A, a company I write about a lot and I think is really smart, they have a, a marketing campaign called Eat More Chicken, where they basically have a cow saying, you know, don't kill me. I'm a cow, eat more chicken, right? That marketing campaign has lasted 25 years. The Affleck duck has lasted 19 years. Are you running a marketing campaign that is strategic or is it tactical? Because the ones that are ta strategic run one or two over a 10 year period and they have monster success. The ones that are tactical, either completely fail or they get lucky and have short-term victories, but eventually all of them fail. And so in your business, what I would look at in 19 is don't go where everybody else is going. Build personal relationships, build your reputation, which is your product or service, and use that as leverage to grow your business and do it in a way, uh, go, go the path that is of least resistance where no one else is going. That's an absolutely incredible answer, Philip. I've got some own homework to do now, thinking about 2019, how I can build that vision that's going to last the impact of a long time, like the 19 years of the Aflac duck. I can't thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. I know that you have some tidbits for the listeners. Where can they stay connected with you? Where should they be checking out? Yeah, you can go to philipstutz.com. I'm sure you can have the correct spelling in your show notes. Um, and look, if you're a business owner, and you're like, I need to figure out my marketing or is my marketing, what's working in my marketing? What's not working? How can I improve the, the give back, like the BPI for those that don't work for me uh, or work with me is uh, we created a free marketing audit to help businesses grow. And what that entails is you go to philipstutz.com backslash audit. And you fill out a five minute marketing form or a five minute form. It's all your publicly available digital footprint. And my team will spend two, three business days pouring over everything. We'll produce a full report and we'll do a 30 minute consultation call where we deliver the report and talk about the things that you're doing right, the things that you can improve. If you have a marketing agency you think is screwing you over, we'll tell you that or we'll tell you if the marketing agency is really good. Um, we've done. Over 500 of these so far in the last year. Um, and it has just been extraordinary to learn about all these businesses and help other people. If you see value in that and you want to work with us, that's awesome. If you don't, I'm good with that too. So that is a, a little offer for your audience if they're interested. Yeah, that's tremendous value. Listeners, I hope you guys take advantage of that. Philip Stutz, I cannot thank you enough for joining us on What Got You There. Sean, thank you for the what you provide. Listen, when I talk about building a relationship, you're doing that right now because your listeners have built relationships with you. You may not know it, but that's the platform that you've created where people care enough about you to download your podcast and listen to you while they're working out. You are part of their lives and you're doing a great job. And uh, I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to share my platform here. If you're listening to this podcast, there's a good chance that your physical fitness is one of the most important aspects of your life. So why do you keep wearing those old workout shorts that are falling apart? Or even worse, when you're at the gym and something smells a little ripe? If that's the case, it's time to turn in those old shorts for a new pair of 10,000 shorts. 
10,000 makes it super simple to purchase your new favorite workout apparel. My new favorite short is their distance short, which is super comfortable, lightweight, and perfect for all of my fitness goals. I can say without a doubt that 10,000 shorts are the most comfortable workout shorts I have ever worn. Like myself, 10,000 is obsessed with nailing the fit with the highest quality materials and construction. For the listeners of What Got You There, 10,000 is offering 20% off your first order of shorts. Yes, that's 20% off. When you check out, make sure you request their one-in, one-out kit. They do this super cool thing when you can send in your old gear you have for recycling and you'll get 10% off your next order. Head to www.10,000.cc forward slash WGYT to receive 20% off your order. And if for some reason you don't love them, they have your back with free shipping, free exchanges, and free returns. A few months ago, my body was experiencing a ton of pain, and that's when my friend and former podcast guest, Noah Olson, turned me on to Pure Spectrum CBD. Their CBD products have been tremendous in relieving a lot of the pain in my body. Their products are pure because everything they make is tested every time for quality, consistency, and efficiency. They're 100% organic, third-party tested. There's a 100% guarantee, and they're THC-free. If you want to receive 10% off the entire site, head to PureSpectrumCBD.com and enter code WGYT. That's 10% off the entire website at PureSpectrumCBD.com with code WGYT. For the What Got You There listeners who love to travel and want to see the world, listen up. We've teamed up with Globekick, who make it affordable to enjoy peak life experiences with like-minded people from around the world. Globekick expertly designs, curates, and scouts global adventures for you to join. Each trip lasts one week and is designed to balance their unique blend of adventure, culture immersion, and relaxation. Globekick has some epic adventures planned, such as cage diving with great white sharks in Cape Town, South Africa, dog sledding and northern light chasing in Norway, and to see the rest, head to globekick.com. If you want to travel the world with your kind of people and not break the bank, then make sure to stop at globekick.com and enter code WGYT to receive 10% off your membership. What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with Shonda Laney? What got you there with Shonda Laney? Uh, what got you there with got you, got you? Thanks for listening to another episode of What Got You There. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review on iTunes and also share with your friends. Thanks so much. Looking forward to talking with you next time. If you want to stay up to date on all things I'm working on behind the scenes and everything we've got going on at What Got You There, head over to whatgotyouthere.com. You'll also be able to see more on podcast guests and what they're doing. Thanks to Justin Great for providing us the intro and outro song. If you like his music and want to find out more about what he's working on, head over to justingreat.com.